Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel, Civil Life. Myself, Milan Patel, Assistant Professor at LG Institute of Engineering and Technology. Today's topic is Advancement in Civil Engineering. This is the third lecture of this topic. In previous lecture, we have covered three topics, Mass Transportation System, BRTS and Metro. In today's lecture, we will cover first, Solid Waste Management, second, Rainwater harvesting and third, water shade management. So, without wasting much time, let's begin with solid waste management. Okay. In this topic, we will cover first what is solid waste management, where is definition of important terms related to solid waste management, classification of solid waste, effects of solid waste, quality and composition of refuse and various steps for solid waste management. So, let's begin with introduction of solid waste management. Okay. Uncontrolled pollution will destroy the ecosystem and the process is irrecoverable. Okay. Hence, the goal of solid waste management is to minimize hazards to environment due to indiscriminate disposal of solid waste. Okay. Based on the knowledge of solid waste generation, Characteristics and treatment methods, certain materials can be recovered or reused, and electrical energy can be generated by this waste. So that's why solid waste management is required. Okay. Now let's discuss various definitions of important terms related to solid waste. First and main term is refuse. It includes all kind of waste in solid state, excepting etc. coming from residential, commercial and industrial area. These refuse are of three types. First is house refuse. This consists of vegetable waste, ashes, cinders, rubbish, debris from cleaning, animal waste matters, debris from demolition of various structures, etc. Second is street refuse. It in includes of street sweepings, trailings, empty packets, and bottles, empty matches box, fruit pills, etc. And the third is trade refuse. It consists of solid waste from various industries, factories, business, and various commercial centers. Okay, these are the various types of refuse. Second is garbage. All types of putrescible or biodegradable waste. Okay, or organic type of waste obtained from kitchen, hotel, restaurant is called as garbage. It also includes animal dung, grass and leaves, bird etc. Okay, it, it is normally weighs about 450 to 900 kg per meter. Third is ashes. These ashes are incombustible waste produced from houses, industries, art or for business. It weighs from 700 to 800 kg per meter cube. Okay. Next is rubbish material. All non perishable waste except ashes are known as rubbish. It is thus includes a wide variety of combustible and non combustible waste such as rags, paper pieces, broken pieces of glass, paper packets, glass and plastic bottles, glass and plastic bottles, broken rockeries, etc. It has higher weight. It varies from 50 to 400 kg per meter. Okay, that's all about various definition of important terms related to solid waste. Now, let's discuss the classification of solid waste. First is based on the place where it is generated and second is depending upon the characteristics of various ingredients of solid waste. Based on place where it is generated, it is divided into three types, domestic solid waste, industrial solid waste and commercial solid waste. The name itself suggests from where it is generated. Okay. By depending upon the characteristic of various ingredients, first is organic type of waste. It includes dry animal and vegetable refuse, cow dung, bird etc, tree leaves, plastic bottles, rags, paper waste etc. Okay. Which are biodegradable in nature. Okay. Second is inorganic waste which includes grit, dust, mud, metal pieces, metal containers, 
broken glass, anchor crevices, waste building material, etc. are called as inorganic type of waste, which is non-combustible, okay, or non-biodegradable. Okay, this is all about the classification of solid waste. Now let's discuss various effects of solid waste. Solid waste changes properties of soil, air, and water, which causes pollution. Okay, solid waste produces fall, smell, breeds insects and organisms. It leads to spread of many diseases, infection, etc., affecting human as well as animal population. Okay, harmful chemicals are released into the environment by this solid waste. Okay, so the various effects of solid waste. Now let's discuss various quality and composition of refuse. It varies from place to place and also varies from season to season. Okay, refuse produced by a society depends upon the living standards of its residents of that particular area. Okay, the quantity of garbage depends upon the food available, food habits, and the standard of living of the people which are living in that particular area. It also depends on the weather of the town and the use of the town, like residential use, commercial use, or industrial use. Okay, the unit weight, which is in the range of 300 to 600 kilogram per meter cube, and calorific value has the range of 1200 to 1800 kilocalorie per kg. Okay, of this refuse. This table gives the average composition by weights of various constituents of the refuse. First is garbage. It is about 50 to 55 percent in the waste. Second is rubbish material. It is about 10 to 15 percent. Third is dust and steel content, which is about 20 to 25 percent in the refuse. And the fourth is ashes, which is about 10 to 15 percent. Okay. This all depends on various categories, which is already discussed above. Okay. Now. Let's discuss various steps for solid waste management. First step is collection and removal of refuse. Nowadays, it is collected by door to door services provided by municipal corporation. Sometimes, public dustbins are provided by municipal corporation at convenient places by the size of the doors. Okay? This is how we collect the various waste or refuse. Second is transportation of this refuse. The refuse collected in the public masonry chambers or big public containers or can is transported to the disposal site by means of following vehicles. First is by auto rickshaw having capacity of 0.5 to 0.75 tons. Second is trailer having capacity of 2 to 3 tons and the third is Trucks having capacity of 5 to 10 tons. Usually, in various cities, trucks are used for transportation of various refuse to the disposal site. Okay. And the last step is the most important step in solid waste management, which is disposal of solid waste or refuse. Let's discuss the various techniques related to disposal of solid waste. First technique is composting, second is landfilling in low lying area. Third is incineration. Fourth is pyrolysis process. And the fifth is pulverization. These are the five techniques which can be used for disposal of solid waste. Okay. First is composting. It is controlled biological decomposition of organic matter such as food and yard goods into hummus. It is the natural process of rotting or decomposition of organic matter by various microorganisms under controlled conditions. Okay, it can be anaerobic or anaerobic in process. Okay, this process takes about four to six weeks. Okay, the end product of the composting process is called as compost, which is rich in fertilizer. Okay, the advantages of this composting method is about. It provides nutrients to the soil. It increases beneficial soil organisms. It also protects soil from erosion. Okay. It assists pollution remediation. Okay. These are the four advantages of this composting method. 
Second method of disposal of solid waste is landfilling in low lying area. A landfill site is a site for disposal of waste materials by burial and it is the oldest form of waste treatment. Okay? Majority all cities are using this type of techniques, landfilling. Okay? Waste is directly dumped into mining voids or borrowings. Disposal waste is compacted and covered with soil. Okay? Gas is generated by decomposing waste materials are often burned to generate power. Okay? Landfilling can be done by three methods. First is trench method, second is India method, and third is ramp method. Okay? These are the three methods which are used for landfilling. Okay? In trench method, it consists of an excavated trench into which the solid waste are spread, compacted, and covered with soil. It is the best suited for nearly level land where the water table is not near the surface. Okay? It is usually followed where water table level is low. Okay? Second is area method. It is the best suited for flat or gently sloping areas where some land deflation may exist. Okay? The waste are sprayed, compacted and then covered. Okay? And the third method is ramp method. It is also known as depression method. Okay? The slope or ramp is sometimes used in combination with other two methods. Okay? The waste are sprayed on an existing slope, compacted and then covered. These are the three methods for landfilling. The advantages of landfilling method is first and main advantage is that the method is very simple. Okay? No costly plant is required. Separation of different components is not required. No residue or byproduct needs to be disposed. Okay? Low lying area or land can be reclaimed or can be increased. Okay? There are also some disadvantages of this landfilling method. First is proper dumping site may not be available in all cities. Okay? Large land areas is required. Okay? Order problem is created in close vicinity of the site because the waste is spread in the large area. Okay, use of insecticide is required. Okay, if you are not using the insecticide in particular site of landfilling, then various diseases are florent. Okay, earth has to be borrowed from other areas for earth layers. Okay, landfills can pollute air, water, and also destroy. These are the disadvantages of this landfilling method. That's all about landfilling method. Now, let's discuss the third method for disposal of solid waste, which is insanitation method. It is a waste management technology that involves the combustion of organic materials and their substances. It is carried out at the high temperature. Okay, the waste material is converted into ash flue gases or particulates. There are various types of incineration method. First is moving grade technique, second is fixed grade technique, third is fluidicide bed technique and the fourth is rotary gain technique. Okay? These are the various techniques which are used in incineration method. Okay? There are also some advantages of incineration. First is this is the most hygienic method. Okay? It complete destruction of pathogens which are available in the refuse. No order trouble is occurred in this type of technique. Okay? Heat generated may be used for raising stream power for electricity generation. Okay? Clinkers produce may be used for road construction also. Okay? Less space is required compared to land filling method. Adverse weather condition has no effect which is affected in land filling method. Okay? Thus are the advantages. Now let's see these advantages of incineration method. It has large initial expense. Okay? Care and attention required, otherwise incomplete combustion will increase air pollution. Okay? Residues are required to be disposed, which needs money. Okay? Large number of vehicles required for solid waste transport to the site of incineration. Okay, these are the four disadvantages of incineration method. 
That's all about insanitation method for this pyrolysis method. It is a thermochemical decomposition of organic material at elevated temperature in the absence of oxygen. Insanitation method is carried out in the presence of oxygen. Why pyrolysis method is carried out in the absence of oxygen? Okay, it is carried out at temperature between 500 degrees centigrade to 1000 degrees centigrade. It involves simultaneous change of chemical composition and physical phase, and it is irreversible. External heat source is employed in this type of technique. Okay, it is gaseous, liquid, as well as solid fractions. Okay, so this is the main advantage of this pyrolysis method. All gases, liquid, and solid generated by this technique is usable. Okay, now let's discuss the fifth method of disposal, which is pulverization method. In this method, the dry refuse is pulverized into the powder form without changing its chemical form. Okay? In this method of refuse disposal, refuse is pulverized in grinding machine so as to reduce its volume and to change its physical characteristics. Okay? The grinded or pulverized refuse becomes practically odorless and unattractive to various insects. Okay? The powder can either be used as a poor quality manure or fertilizer or it can be easily used to dispose by landfill. Okay? The method is quite costly and has not commonly used in India. Okay? That's all about various techniques of disposal or solid waste. Okay? These are the various steps of solid waste management. That's all about solid waste management. Now, let's discuss the second topic in today's lecture, which is rainwater harvesting system, in which we will cover first introduction of rainwater harvesting, various benefits of rainwater harvesting, and lastly, we will cover the system of rainwater harvesting. Okay. First, introduction of rainwater harvesting. In semi arid or arid regions, both surface water as well as groundwater are scarce. Therefore, attempts are made in this region to collect and preserve rainwater to maximum possible extent. Okay? This collection of rainwater is called water harvesting, which is defined as collection of rainwater and runoff primarily for irrigation, human, or livestock consumption. Okay? Rainwater harvesting is the accumulating and storing of rainwater for reuse before it reaches the aquifer. Okay. That's all about the rainwater harvesting. Let's discuss its benefits. It increases water availability to various animals as well as people. It checks the declining water table and augment groundwater table. Okay, or increase this groundwater table. It is environmentally friendly technique. It improves the quality of groundwater also. It prevents shrine erosion caused by the runoff of the water and flooding, especially in urban areas. Surface water runoff conservation during monsoon is possible with the help of rainwater harvesting. It increases a culture of water conservation in the future generation. Okay? That's all about the benefits of rainwater harvesting system. Let's discuss how it is worked out. There are various methods for rainwater harvesting system. First is rainwater collection or rooftop rainwater harvesting system. Second is runoff collection or surface runoff harvesting. Third is recharge to the groundwater. And the fourth is runoff enhancement. Okay. Let's discuss first rainwater collection or rooftop rainwater harvesting, in which we will discuss first. What is rooftop rainwater harvesting system? What is the need of rooftop rainwater harvesting system? And lastly, we will cover various components of rooftop rainwater harvesting. First is introduction of rooftop rainwater harvesting system. It is the technique through which rainwater is captured from roof catchment and stored in subsurface groundwater reservoir. Okay? 
The main objective is to make water available for future use. The quality of harvest rainwater is usually clean following proper installation and maintenance. The effective roof area and the material used in construction of roof largely influence the efficiency and the quality of the water which is saved by rooftop rainwater harvesting. Okay? Now let's discuss need for rooftop rainwater harvesting. First, to meet the ever increasing demand for water, to reduce the runoff which chokes strong days, rooftop rainwater harvesting is necessary. To avoid flooding of roads, it is necessary. To augment or increase groundwater storage and control decline of water table, rainwater harvesting is necessary. To reduce groundwater pollution, rooftop rainwater harvesting is necessary. It is used to improve the quality of groundwater. It is used to reduce the soil erosion. It is used to supplement domestic water requirement during summer and to reduce the cost for pumping of groundwater. Okay, these are the various needs for rooftop rainwater harvesting system. Okay. Now let's discuss the components of rooftop rainwater harvesting. Okay. By this figure, you can easily see various components required in rooftop rainwater harvesting system. First is collection area. Okay. The collection area which is shown in this figure okay, by so roof okay, which collects the rainwater is included in collection area. Second is conveyor system, okay, which consists various pipelines and gutters which guides the water from roof to the storage facility. Okay. Third is storage facility in which water tanks okay, are there. Okay. There is one underground water tank and overhead water tank is used. Okay. And last is delivery system which consists of a tap or a pumping system okay, which is used to retrieve or used to get the water from the water tank. Okay. These are the four main components of rooftop rainwater harvesting. Okay. That's all about rooftop rainwater harvesting system. Now, let's discuss the second method of rainwater harvesting, which is runoff collection of, or you can say, surface runoff harvesting. Storage of rainwater on surface is the traditional techniques and structures used are small dams, tanks, etc. Okay, these are these figures shows various runoff collection techniques or various structures related to surface runoff harvesting. Okay, you can clearly see check dam in that. Check dam is a structure which is used for surface runoff harvesting. Okay, there are also various other structures like digging wells, ponds, and reservoirs, storage tanks, or reservoirs. Okay, this improves the groundwater recharge as well as the quality of available groundwater. Okay. Third technique is recharge to the groundwater. It is the new concept of rainwater harvesting and the structure is generally used to recharge the groundwater is pits, trenches, dug wells, hand pumps, recharge wells, lateral saps with bore wells, spreading techniques, underground reservoir. Okay, these are the various techniques or structures which are used to recharge the groundwater. Okay, this is the third technique of rainwater harvesting and the fourth is runoff management how you can increase the rainfall okay recent studies have shown that under favorable condition on an average about 10 percentage increase in precipitation or rainfall can be expected by this runoff management technique okay the weather modification or cloud seeding can be done to increase precipitation or to decrease evapotranspiration. Okay? Cloud seeding is generally done to increase precipitation which ultimately increases the runoff of the water. Okay? It has been estimated that the precipitation rate is increased by about 10 percentage by this cloud seeding technique. Okay? In cloud seeding, various chemicals are sprayed in the clouds like silver iodide chemical. That's all about various techniques of rainwater harvesting system.
That's all about rainwater harvesting system. Okay. Now let's move to the third topic in today's lecture, which is water shade management. To understand this topic, first of all, you have to understand what is water shade. Okay. This is the area of land from which water drains into water bodies like stream, river, lake, or reservoir. It is also known as drainage basin or catchment area. It is an area surrounded by rich land. Okay. Then we will discuss about characteristic of watershed and lastly we will discuss about watershed management. Okay. Let's discuss characteristics of watershed. Characteristics of watersheds are the various points to be considered while watershed management. First is size. Okay. Some watershed size is about 100 to 500 square kilometer. Mini watershed size is about 10 to 100 square kilometer. Micro watershed size is about 1 to 10 square kilometer. And mini watershed size is less than 1 square kilometer. Okay. So size of watershed also affects the watershed management. Okay. Second is shape. Various shapes of watersheds are fan shape, front, leaf shape, triangular, circular type of shape. Okay. Shapes of watershed affects the run of characteristics. Third is slope of watershed. The degree of slope affects the velocity of surface runoff, infiltration of water, and the soil erosion. Okay, so it is very important factor for watershed management. Okay, fourth is vegetation in watershed area. Vegetation cover affects the surface runoff and infiltration rate. Okay, vegetation increases infiltration rate and also reduces the erosion of the soil. Okay. Fifth is land use. Land use pattern is useful for planning, programming and implementing watershed development projects. Okay. Sixth is climate of the watershed. Meteorological parameters like rainfall, temperature, humidity, wind velocity, etc. in watershed area determine the availability of water in the area. Okay. And which is and it is useful for watershed management. And the last is geology and soils. Rocks and soil types affects water storage, movement and infiltration of the water. Okay, So it is also an important criteria which should be considered for watershed management. Okay, That's all about characteristics of watershed. Now let's discuss watershed management. In which, first of all, we will discuss what is watershed management, various objectives of watershed management, and lastly, we will discuss various components of watershed management. So, what is watershed management? Watershed development, in a broad sense, implies conservation and development of land, rainfall water, and vegetation resources of the area for the maximum benefit of the people. Okay. The comprehensive development of a watershed so as to make productive use of all its natural resources and also protect them is termed as watershed management. Okay. Watershed management is not merely anti erosional or anti runoff approach, but also a comprehensive integrated approach of land and water resource management. Okay. This is called as watershed management. Now, let's discuss various objectives of watershed management. First, it is used for conserving soil and water of this watershed area. Second is, it is used for growing greenery in this watershed area. It is used to control desertification of the soil. It is used to mitigate the adverse effects of drought on crops as well as livestock which are living in this particular area. It is used for improving the ability of land to hold the water. Okay. It is used to encourage restoration of ecological balance between the environment and the people. It is used to promote economic development of village community. These are the seven objectives of watershed management. Now, let's discuss various components of watershed management. First component is water management. Water management is the science for the proper utilization of water by the cultivators. Okay. 
various methods for water conservation are reservoir management which includes the methods of reducing percolation losses, reducing conveyance losses by proper lining of the canals, applications of right amount of water to the land to meet water requirements of the crops, constructing small check dams across the tributaries of river to increase groundwater storage. Okay. New techniques should be developed for sewage disposal to reduce water consumption. Okay, these are the five methods for water conservation. Okay. Second component is soil and land management. The soil conservation methods should be adopted in the catchment area. The soil irrigation can be decreased by intercepting erosive power of rain and wind with vegetative cover, decreasing slope of the land, increasing roughness of the land by different operations. The agricultural land should be properly leveled to obtain uniform growth of plants with optimum quantity of water. The deep plugging by tractors is much effective in retaining water to get maximum yield with optimum supply of water. Okay. Earthworms should be constructed around farms to retain the water to reduce the runoff. Okay. Third component is human resource development. The NGO staff, village watershed committees and watershed communities must be trained technical, social and managerial capacities. Okay. Fourth, afforestation. Tree plantation in wasteland restricted area must be carried out. Measures to be taken to control tree cutting and forest fire. Fifth, Crop management. It should be practiced for maintaining fertility of the land for obtaining maximum yield with minimum water supply. For that, crop management is required. Sixth, livestock management. Livestock population in watershed comprises cows, bullocks, buffaloes, sheep, goats, camels, etc. Cow, buffalo, and camels are treated as large livestock. And the others are the small livestock. Okay. And the last component is rural energy management. Prevention of local environment degradation by replacing traditional fuel sources by renewable energy sources. So you have to use various renewable sources like solar energy, wind energy, tidal energy in this watershed area for proper rural energy management. Okay. These are the seven components of watershed management. That's all about watershed management. I hope you all understand these three topics, solid waste management, rainwater analysis system and watershed management. See you soon in the next lectures. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Civil Line. Thank you.